We are live. Okay, we're live. Hello, everyone, to another edition of Culture and Identity with me and Brian. We never really know what we're going to talk about, but we kind of get there in the end. I think we've got kind of lots of interesting stuff. We, the great thing is we, we have a, a, a conversation on Twitter, and, and we kind of walk it out, work it out somehow. Um, where do you want to start? Um, we've got the attacks on whiteness with the, the Cheddar Man. Yeah, let's and start. Let's start because you just wrote that piece. It's fresh in everyone's minds. Okay, I've got good. On that too. You, why don't you summarize your piece? Um, okay, basically, um, the well, I, I'll give you a quick rundown on on my thoughts yesterday. There were two pieces of news on on attacks on whiteness. Basically, we don't need to go down to the the great replacement or even white genocide, but but the the, the doing down of whiteness and European culture um, started mid-morning yesterday with a, a report that Robert Spencer had tweeted out. I can't remember where it was. It was I think it might have been on front page or something like this, where he reported that a Pakistani Muslim had become of the head of the Swedish Heritage Society or what it, you know, a bit like, you know, dealing with Swedish culture. And he had admitted in an interview that he wasn't interested in either history or archaeology and he'd studied he'd done islamic studies at university hardly the best choice so when a couple of hours later the news of the cheddar man being black came out i was reasonably skeptical about things you know it's it, it all depends on how the day has been set up but given that I hadn't really had enough time to, I was doing other things. I'm, I'm updating my Barcelona's.com website. It's now a, solidly around about the 700,000 in the world mark, which is quite good, really. And I'm kind of working with some sponsors on that. So I was busy yesterday, and I didn't have time to do all the proper reading. So I tweeted out, um, I can't remember exactly what I tweeted out. It's something like, um, anti-white propaganda um so the original britons had um black skin curly black hair and blue eyes really i think it's very very dangerous when science in inverted commerce is is used for a political agenda um which i think is a moderate uh, is a moderate take on things and and this morning i went through i did the due diligence I watched various videos, watched the uh, interviews with the researchers, read the articles, and come to the conclusion that it's pretty much exaggerated bullshit in that it really doesn't make any massive differences. One, they're extrapolating that the whole of the British population 10,000 years ago were, are all like this one individual. Yeah. When they admit in the same cave there's evidence of previous civilizations from 5,000 years earlier. Diversity? Was there diversity in the cave? Well, that, that's, that's the, but I think there probably was. There, and, and these people had polished cups and apparently ate each other. This is, this is yes, what they I were. Yes, I saw they ate the fingertips. Uh, yes, lovely. Just, weird stuff. Mm. Um, s secondly, um, they, the researchers assert that, once again, from one individual, that all individuals in Britain were like him. When previously they'd admitted that in the previous Ice Age, various flows of, 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 individual, of, of, of humanoids had come across from, from Europe, because I, I can't remember what it's called now, it's Doggerland or something. There was, a, there was a land mass connection between mainland Europe and the British Isles. If they haven't had, found the skeletons, how did they know they died out? So it was, it's quite possible that he was um, living alongside people of other mm, racial types. Now, I, don't, I don't even think ethnicities is the word because there were var various humanoid types, homo sapiens, Neanderthals, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not an expert on this. And finally, um, the reason why he, he was apparently black and the, what the Guardian article said, it, it's, it said it suggests he was black. So I think there's a 76% chance that he was black. It doesn't really matter what fucking color he was. Um, basically, we all know, or, or the standard theory is that 
um, Homo sapiens came out of Af Africa. So were the, they were black at some point. The question is, when were they black? And what were the reasons for, for them changing from black to white? And it seems that Northern European, uh, the Northern European climate, um, it's not beneficial to have so much melanin in the skin, but this very much depends on your diet. And hunter and gatherers got, apparently got vitamin D from fish and eating animal livers. God knows how they know this. And the, the Europeans became white once they got into farming and had a, a, a more varied European diet. That's basically what it is. But my conclusion in the, in the article is that the image that the first Britain was black is being we weaponized by the multicultural globalist left. And really, it doesn't tell us anything new. And no, I'm not crying rightist tears over the fact that he was black. I don't care. Um, but that's the but, same. Look, that's that's the same view that I have. And and I mean, it comes down to if one has spent too much time listening to the alt right, um, the, the the real alt right, and that's then. And with with the obsession on ethno states, skin and skin tone, especially skin tone, what's special about Europe, or in, I would say in my case, my people in the Middle East, is the combination of where we were, the the specific environments that our cultures and civilizations grew up in, and what that made people do. And the kind of alt right gets part of this because they talk about how being and you, you're good on this, being good at planning for the future, having cold winters, so you have to put food aside in the summer and save it for the winter when, when there's not going to be much around. All of those kinds of things, um, they, they drive you towards certain traits that we now recognize as useful, planning, um, uh, good stewardship of your land, you know, heading towards, you know, away from the hunter-gatherers and towards uh, an agrarian model which you know, paleo diets notwithstanding, the only reason we can live in cities and have such vast numbers of human beings lying around, you know, standing around on, on, on the same land as we had, you know, millennia ago is because of farming, because bulk production of food. You know, we're not all involved in the production of our own food. It happens in bulk and it's very efficient. I mean, the world is being fed today at rates and levels that were not predicted even 50 years ago even 50 years ago they said you know there was the the population bomb book which like all malthusian science science said oh my god we're going to have too many people everybody's going to die we can't feed each other turns out today we're feeding ourselves the, the only major reasons for famine are political you know people just don't have good governance and so they get I'm not sure whether it's as sim simple as that because the, I mean there are population explosions occurring and okay and this is this is where I get into trouble. But what they want is resource constraints. Right. The resource constraints I, are I largely you, you know we 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 solve most of our resource problems as and when they crop up. But but it's, I think it's pretty clear though that if things continue the way they are, I I don't have the statistics at hand. But the population explosion in sub-Saharan Af Africa. I mean, sub-Saharan, something else that I've been thinking about, and this will once again inevitably get me into trouble, that um, one of the reasons why my thought thinking is going into areas where people, I get accused of being alt-right, I've, I've actually decided that, that alt-right is the new word for racist or far-right. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, it, it, it makes anybody who tries to talk seriously about these kind of issues just gets dubbed and that's it. But um, there's obviously going to be a population explosion in, well, there is a population explosion in sub-Saharan Africa, um, which, which isn't as sustainable. And, and then you kind of get into these also alt-right or, or topics that the alt-right tend to discuss, like the R and K selection types. Um, <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah the, dif the differences between cultures um, but okay, that, about the population of southern uh, southern Africa or Sahara sub-Saharan Africa. At one point, Rhodesia, as it was then called, subsequently Zimbabwe, fed or produced enough food to feed all of Africa. What happened? Politics. 
they started killing white farmers. And now the killing of white farmers has spread south to South Africa. So the problem of not being able to feed Africa is going to, if it comes at all, it will come from murdering productive white farmers and replacing them with unproductive means uh, of managing the same land. The land there can support well, the people if run properly. Okay, if, if run properly to a certain extent, but, but here we go into the complex di differences between the racism. This is, this is where you get into trouble. That the, 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 fact, the fact is that most of, of Africa has remained hunter-gatherer in ethos. And to a certain extent, communism is a, is a hunter-gatherer ideology. It's not about, it's not practical. It's not about thinking for the future. It's about taking what you can get. So, so this combination, the, one of the massive dangers of communism and the AN, uh, you, you know, we've been discussing um, South Africa in general. I mean, the ANC were very associated with the, with the South African Communist Party. They're essentially, and still are, communist in ethos. Um, this is why they've got this culture of killing the providers, i.e. the whites. But it, it's irrelevant. It, it's not really a question of color here. It's a question of um, this, this um, privilege versus, versus oppressed ethic that communism is based on. And, and they're, they're destroying their own, own economy. And at the same time, Western aid is allowing them to basically survive. And because there's this, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting myself into deep water here because I haven't really thought these ideas through enough to, to state this as fact. But the, but, the, but the Western aid is allowing them to continue, continue reproducing. And there's a, there's a false situation. So this, there's this um, population explosion occurring in Africa which eventually, when violence happens, when things break down, is going to result in more immigration into Europe. And one of my new theories is that the whole Islam issue is masking this, this dreadful um, Af African population explosion, which at the end of the day, irrespective, and I'm, we're not talking about the color of people's skin, essentially. We're talking about differences in, in culture, differences in attitude, differences in education that are just going to be unsustainable. And when Africa explodes, um, I think Europe is going to feel the brunt. Listen, I can't, I can't argue sense. with a great de deal of that. Um, uh, it, it just, it's kind of depressing. I mean, I, I, I've said this in various places, but obviously I was born in South Africa, never lived there, left when I was a baby. Uh, and, uh, used to go back every Christmas, but that stopped in the mid 80s. Um, and then the last time I was there was 1987, I believe, which is pre Mandela coming out and pre all the changes. So I grew up in England, Jewish, South African. So fortunately, I don't know, the demonization of Israel in the early 80s or the, the late 70s hadn't <laughs> hadn't quite picked up steam. You're a buster on, on every level. Oh yeah, totally. Oh, man, so I, I, I don't know why I maintain a relationship. A South African Jew. <laughs> exactly. Oh, God. I mean. Well, and and the other thing was that um, so Jew, you know, again, oh, back to you know, the, the it was there were a lot of left wing Jews in South Africa agitating against apartheid, and um, so when once once South Africa switched and reverted and and i think i i do genuinely believe mandela was a special figure a very special historical figure that doesn't arrive in many places very often you know oh there goes my flag um yeah the <laughs> once once they they transitioned to apartheid out of apartheid mandela kept things in line while he was alive but there's huge resentment amongst the white boers uh, the afrikaners and the other whites um, against Jews for being on the left and agitating against apartheid. And then there's huge resentment on the black side because it was known that the white, um, the white government was working with Israel. I think it's a pretty commonly held belief that I can neither confirm nor deny that if, if Israel has tested any nuclear weapons, they were done in conjunction with South Africa's nuclear weapons program and sort of 
bits of the Kalahari Desert or something went bang. Um, so, and and also the the model for the disarmament of South Africa of its nuclear weapons because South Africa had nuclear weapons was that Mandela got into the job on day one and he he picked up the phone and said I don't want nuclear weapons I don't think anybody around here is comf- I don't want anybody here having nuclear weapons so he called up the uh, International Atomic Energy Authority and said come down here and verify for me that all of my people have got rid of all the nuclear weapons. And that was the model for weapons inspections that just doesn't work when it's a dictator in the Middle East who wants his nuclear weapons. So mm. South Africa, well, that, that transition was very interesting. But what? The, but the position that they're in now, and I mean, I must say, moving on to the sort of the videos that have been coming out from Lauren Southern and... and well, I, I, um, I, want, I want to take Katie this Hopkins. back, actually. Let's, let's okay. leave Lauren Southern let's, and... We'll wait, that. we'll wait for that. Because I want to challenge you on Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Um, Basically, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a huge, huge, huge expert, but um, one of my friends on Facebook, um, hey, I'm dreadful with names, Hazel, I think her name is, um, was, was brought up in South Africa and now lives in the UK. And when I express interest in this, um, she's been sending me videos that she found particularly interesting. Um, as I tweeted out um, in my politically incorrect way, uh, as I do the other day, Nelson Mandela, what a cunt. Um, <laughs> and I think that's, I think that's a, that's a, I think that's a safe, that's, a, that's kind of the whole thing boiled down to as, in as few words as you possibly can, can get. Um, the great thing about these, these videos is that um, you don't just get the, the media hype. You get people actually on video giving the speeches. Now, there's not much from the 1960s, but there's quite a lot from the 1980s. Um, the first thing to, to bear in mind is the ANC and the South African Com- Communist Party were highly, highly linked. Um, the Soviet mm-hmm. Union sent, I mean, Nelson Mandela was in prison for most of this time, but uh, the Soviet Union sent activists, um, ANC activists, to train in Vietnam to in, in, and learn the tactics of engaging um, Mao-style people's wars, where, where the, there's this combination of political action and demonstration and completely unwanted and controlled violence. Bear in mind, Nelson Mandela was put in prison, I think, in 1964. When he was put in prison, he wasn't just some kind of nice pacifist writer. No, he was head of the ANC military wing. Correct. Okay. And, I, and I remember, I mean, just to interject, I remember being there at Christmas times um, and in the new, and I'd be in Durban or where my grandparents lived. And, um, you know, there'd be a news report that there'd been a limpet mine that had gone off in a, in a waste paper bill and killed and injured people. So it was real. It was, it was sort of similar. It was real. I mean, it was real terrorism. People were, they, were, they weren't vastly effective, kind of like the Israeli, what we faced in Israel at the same time. But yeah, they were blowing people up and killing people. Absolutely, and I knew that. But, but while he was but it, being, it was much brave. more. It was much more anarchistic, and particularly the role of Winnie Mandela, mm-hmm. who, who yeah. came across. And and okay, the the great thing about one of these videos, I'll try and sort out that I've got the link somewhere. But there's interviews of her and met Nelson Mandela saying, "We come in peace. We just want justice. There's this great injustice in our society and." Apartheid, 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 etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, Winnie Mandela had her own hit squad that was called the Football Club, and Correct. there's a great speech of her talking about how we're gonna we're gonna beat our opponents, and this is the, this included the Zulus under Butalezi, who Butalezi, when you see him interviewed, seemed a lot more of a decent sort. I didn't think so at the time because I believed the free Nelson Mandela bullshit as a lefty student. Um, but there's one speech that she's giving to a crowd and she says, um, we're gonna beat our opponent, opponents with matches and necklaces. And I don't know if you know, does, do you know what necklacing was? I know was? exactly what necklacing was. It, well, it, it, it's putting people in, in tires and pouring petrol on it and, yeah. uh, and basically setting them alight inside burning tires. It's Yeah, they, it's they put a, 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 tire, a tire around somebody's neck and set a light to it. And she had a, a, a gang, 
dreadful, well, strange name for it, but they were called the Football Club, I think. Um, and they, these were the instigators of necklacing for the ANC all over the place. And basically what they do is they burn someone to death. And this was happening in townships everywhere. Anyone who was a po an opponent um, or suspected of, of, of being a, a, a grass on, on the organization, they were, they were summarily murdered in this way, in the most brutal way possible. And this yep. was part of the tactics of the ANC. It's just to, to spread violence and discontrol. It was them, I always thought that Desmond Tutu was okay, but it was Tutu and the ANC who were pushing for sanctions because they were willing, they were happier, just as all communists are, they would rather get, get power and everybody be a lot worse off than mm, continue with the so-called inequalities in society. And the final thing, the reason why I think I'm fair in saying, and I apologize for my, well, I don't apologize for my language, but Nelson Mandela, what a cunt, is <laughs> when he came out of prison, about three days after he came out of prison, the first speech he gave to, to the ANC, and this was inevitably not reported by the, the, the foreign press, but basically, he was continuing the communist line. We're going to continue fighting. We're going to continue the arms struggle. We're going to kill a lot of them. This is what he said um, at a meeting of own supporters. Two days later, two or three days later, he gave an interview to the foreign press where it was all peace and love and we just want justice. Um, I, I have lost all belief I had in Nelson Mandela in the course of, of two days this week. Um, and I, and I, I might write an article. I'll, I'll definitely, um, in, in the web page that I, I associate with this conversation, is I'll put links to these videos so you can look, you can look at them yourself. And it's mm. pretty clear what, what happened, really. Anyway, yeah, I, there's, I, I, there's I, my, my diatribe is over. I think the only thing to be said is that the slaughter of whites didn't begin immediately. It's taken a, it's taken twenty years, um, but I again I haven't you know I knew that I was nervous at the time because I'd grown up hearing the South African side more than I'd heard the foreign press side. So I'd gone there each time. I mean I knew the conditions that people lived in, um, but then again you know I was always with nice families, mostly Jewish, who you know to a child's eye appeared to treat their their servants well so but it, you know it was a terribly conflicted thing because i was seeing one thing with my own eyes and being told a different thing by the press and i guess maybe that is what started me from a very young age of being deeply suspicious whenever i was hearing uh, you know third parties tell me about something that i had seen with my own eye um, so, you know, obviously I hadn't seen every aspect of every condition that went on in South Africa, but some bits of it weren't as bad as they were saying. And so discordant views, you know, I just didn't try. And I mean, even back to your Cheddar Gorge thing, as soon as, as soon as I saw the headlines on that, I thought, you know what, I just can't trust the press. If I really wanted to look into this, I'd have to go and get the original academic article and plow through it, which I'm probably capable of understanding it. I, you know, with Google to look up fancy words at my side, I can make my way through almost any scientific paper in any field. It's just, do I have the time to do that work? And I don't think I do. But the, but the problem is I just don't trust the media to relay any information to me anymore. I just don't. I, mean, I, I, just want to, don't. I don't want to move away from South Africa yet. Actually, the Guardian article that I based my, my article today on was was fairish actually it had mm -hmm. a bit of spin on it but i got the feeling that the science writer had written a decent article and the editor had put the spin in um and but, the headline uh, and the lead had you know been I'm, I'm getting inserted. quite familiar with reading articles and, but and is, i think a lot this of this is a great skill this uh, this deconstructive skill so okay this article is going to contain a series of facts i need to now discern those facts and strip out where an editor has tried to mold it. And I mean, we get this all the time with, with court reporting, with it just, it, I guess I've pushed it to the back of my mind. I've become quite adept, I think, of reading news stories 
and separating. And that, that's a big problem these days. People yeah. don't do this. Let's, let's, there's, there's various things coming up in, ch in the chat, which is great, actually. It's great to get this feedback. Um, but the, the, the South Africa thing, back to the South Africa thing, one of the reasons that sparked my interest, obviously, Lauren Southern and Katie Hopkins, I've not actually watched all their videos. But another I, I've got to tell you, I started that. watching one of Lauren Southern's one and actually turned it off. And I don't, I'm not, I don't feel myself squeamish, but I've heard yeah. bad stories from South Africa for years. And I just, there's, you know, my friend who, who was almost killed, she, she wrote an excellent piece a while back about how just our entire society is too inured to death. We see too much death, more than we were designed for. And I just thought, I don't actually want to, I know it's happening and it's horrible. I just, I'm not sure I want to see more of it. And I think a lot of people have that reaction. Anyway, back yeah, to Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think we have to face up to the truth. And, and I think South Africa is one of the canaries in the coal, coal mine. And we're, we're, we're circling this issue of, of the anti-white campaign, essentially. But one of the reasons that, one of the things that got me interested is, I don't know if anybody saw The Way Forward on Sunday, but I had Luke Nash Jones and Luke, you, you, people have differing opinions of Luke. I like Luke. Uh, we met at the, the last day of silence last year. Um, he's, he's a decent guy and he's, he, I think he was born in Rhodesia. He's definitely got family in Rhodesia and he's also got family in South Africa. And so he's he's very much on the case with this. And a, a couple of weeks ago, um, he spoke at a presentation in the uh, in uh, in Brussels. It wasn't an official EU event, but it was it was organised by the Marine Marine Le Pen group, of which Janice Watkinson, I think his name is. Her name is Janice Watkinson. Janice Wilkinson, who's a former UK MP, brought over a South African campaigner. And it was very interesting mm -hmm. listening to the campaigner speak and him talking about, I mean, South Africa is not a, hom or according to him, South Africa is not a homogeneous country. There are various different languages. There, there were at one point various different homelands. And in many respects, the different ethnicities, including the whites, would be better off with their own homelands in South Africa. And this, this whole business of trying to create falsely create a single country where it's not possible and bringing the whole level to the of the country down as low as possible in in this typical communist way is very dangerous and another uh, conversation there's a, a south african economist i watched the other day and he said the the future plan is that the anc only about 35% 40% of people are voting in South Africa, but there's a highly active communist, you know, real commun communist party there. And what he sees is in the in the next elections, the ANC not winning a majority and having to form a coalition with the South African Communist Party. So things are going to go from bad to worse, uh, and it looks it looks like a very very dangerous situation. Well, I, you know, I see parallels with what 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 occurred here in the Middle East, in that South Africa as a country, you know, basically Africa just doesn't, Africa was divided up by colonial, real colonial powers. France, Britain, uh, the Dutch, they, they had, and these boundaries were really laid on top of a very, very diverse group of but tribes. It wasn't. And, but, but it wasn't, it was, it was, it was, oh, okay. Tell me that I'm wrong because I need more information. I need to do proper reading on this. The problem with having these conversations is I get a new topic and I, I don't <laughs> have enough time to really learn enough about it. But um, I think it was 1862, I'm, I might get the dates right, when, when the, um, the Dutch, um, Dutch Protestants arrived on in South Africa, at which point it was occupied primarily by Hottentots who were the, the South African Bushmen, and it was pretty much unoccupied and, yeah, land. I agree with that. that, that since, that's as far as I've read too. Yeah, since then, various generally Protestant groups, including German Lutheran Lutherans, I think some Huguenots, and the English all came. 
Yeah. Um, things were pottering along in a kind of farmy, little house on the prairie kind of way um, for a few centuries until first diamonds and then gold were found, at which point the South African econ economy really exploded and at which point Bantus from other parts of Africa, I think, I'm not sure, I think mainly West Africa, um, moved to South Africa. So, so it's not as if the blacks are the original inhabitants. Then the, 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 the Negroid blacks, for want of a better word, no, I'm not being racist. I'm trying to dis distinguish them from the hot term, and yeah, yeah. It's a technical Listen, term. Well, I think essentially what, what I was trying to say is exactly what you just said, which is that there wasn't uh, the, the, the structure of the borders of countries, I can trace out South Africa, that did not exist, obviously, prior to Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. The, these places were not, then obviously, they were not well defined until um, European white men came up and drew and but started they, to draw boundaries on maps. Now, but sometimes they, they used, defined until much, much later. Because, much, much later. Because because we, I, and I can't remember, uh, and, I'm sorry, sorry, listeners, I can't remember all the names, but there's Swaziland, the, the various states well, the that it was. And there were sorry. some tribal areas, and, and yeah. it, but again, the, the, it's not cut and dried in the history. I agree also, I don't think that white South Africans, like I'm very happy to say that the Boer culture, the du derived from the Dutch, the Dutch Boer culture of farming there is a unique I'd say now, indigenous culture to South Africa in that they, they, they arrived speaking Dutch and today they speak Afrikaans and these are different languages. They, they have different ways of eating and farming and things that would never have worked and don't work in Holland. And so they've got an entire new culture that they've built on that land. And so the idea of saying to them, go back to Holland, it's, ridic it's, as, it's ridiculous yeah. as saying to Jews, go back to Poland. It doesn't... I mean, and actually listening to interviews and listening to South Africans speak, it's made me, you know, I'm, I'm, I know people criticize me about this, but I'm a white European and I think Europeans are essentially white. It's, we're ethnically white and anybody else is a visitor. Thank you. Uh, we need to treat you. You might be a citizen. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy for be people to be a visitor or an unwelcome visitor. Yeah, and I'm quite happy to admit that that people of other ethnicities are British, but you're not English, mate. I'm English. I live in Catalonia, but I'm English because I'm ethnically English. There's a dis distinction between eth ethnicities. But actually, listening to the South Africans speak, who has made me rethink this, and I might be working through more ideas. I, I try to be open to the ideas as as they come in, but. These Afrikaners are African. They're white Africans. And there's no way you can get them to admit to being anything else. They feel, they feel as much, um, they identify as closely with the land, blood and soil, Carl calling me uh, going 1488. I'm not yeah, watching okay. the chat. I'm not watching the chat. <laughs> I'm watching the chat. Um, um, but they identify with the land, and this is an important issue. And the fact is that the, these white tribes have been on this piece of land for for longer than many of the blacks who are claim, claiming ownership. Correct. Of, which is and, and not only that, they a unique culture that is unique to South Africa. Afrikaner Boer culture doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, except maybe in a place called Renana, just up the road. But but it. It, 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 that they built that there and and the, having them sort of having the world suddenly decide one day oh okay now it's okay to push these people out is horrific same with you know rhodesia zimbabwe the, the people there had come and been there a heck of a long time produced a great actually a very productive society and pushing yeah. them out in favor of skin color only was a big disaster for everybody for the blacks and for the whites and, and it's, this, it's also this issue, and the reason why um, South Africa needs to capture our attention is, is because it's a canary in the coal, coal mine. And they, they've still got, a, I mean, white South Africans are what, something like 8% of the population now. I was also watching the way the population, um, the demographics have changed. It's like black South Africans in the last 20 years have, have 
I'm, I'm, once again, I can't remember all the statistics. I need to check this. But they've tripled in numbers. So the, the population is exploding. And the, the proportions of numbers is, is, are very different now from what they were prior to, um, to the end of apartheid in, what was it, 1993, 1994. So things are changing very fast. And basically, the, the white South Africans are being removed. And, and this is a case of, and it will end up being a case of white genocide. I think this is where you can, you can easily use the term. Um, I think it's the only it, it, it's the only place where well, if we're talking about the genocide part of actually murdering people, then yes, uh, uh, population replacement. I'm more you know that that is probably what's happening in Europe to a certain degree. But yeah, I agree, and and I watch on horrified. I, I absolutely horrified because what it what I'm looking for everywhere is human thriving. Is just are people living to a better standard than they were a generation before? And I think generally the only, the only way, the place where that happens is Western European societies, that's America too. They've gone through generations of improvement, fewer people but the, in real poverty and, and, and starvation. And But we're getting over the cusp we, now, aren't we? Because We're because looking, yeah. The, we're looking at, and, at, and at standard generations of, now where, where standard of livings are declining, and that is horrible. Yeah, I mean, effective wages haven't risen um, for the last dec decades or so. And what's going to happen with a population explosion in Africa, I think, and particularly the next economic crisis um, will actually lead sub, sub Saharan Af Africa into serious po poverty. I mean, I, once again, I'm completely against sending ridiculous aid to parts of the world that firstly don't deserve it and don't do anything profitable with the money if they're just going to have more kids and give each other more cases of aids well it's not really a great deal sending a great idea sending aid to them um, if you could productively and usefully improve their societies and make them self-sufficient then possibly that might be work, worth it but that's not what what's happening what what is happening is is the the West is financing population um, explosion in, in sub-Saharan Afri Africa, which ultimately is going to come and bite it on it bite it on it on its ass because it's going to result in a massive flow of, of immigration from from Africa, which can't possibly yep. be good because that will make Europe unsustainable as well. Anyway, yep. happy news. Um, so, happy should we news. move to yes. my story? Okay, we'll move to one. Of, I just want to make a quick. I can't remember who who it said now. Uh, the reason why I I distinguished between English and British is I think English is an ethnicity, and you can be British and have a citizenship. So I think yeah. um, somebody can be a I British always, citizen. I always thought but can't of myself be ethnically in, in English. I always thought of myself as British. I was struggling to call myself English, even though. In the Six Nations, I always cheered for England versus Scotland, Wales, or any of the other home nations, and especially the French and Irish and the Italians when they okay. arrived. Yeah. It took me years to get used to Six Nations, not Five Nations. But anyway, yeah, them, you're right. Anyway, I think that's clear. Have, anyway. Let's move on to one of your topics, Brian. Well, I'm sorry, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm occupying all the time today. You're occupy. You're an occupier. It's connected exactly. with that. I'm a squatter. It's, Big story in Israel. Well, it's actually not a big story in Israel, which is that we're on the verge here of sending back what we call in Israel infiltrators. So again, it's language. It's fun. it's it's a basic. Well, <laughs> well okay. Sorry. So so we, you know, in, back in the uh, about ten years ago. Uh, we started seeing an increase in um, people coming from Af mostly from Africa, but from, from other places as well, entering Israel illegally. And the main vector of this was was that they would um, go north through Africa, go cross Egypt through the Sinai, and then walk into Israel. And now Sinai border was largely undefended, didn't have a wall or a fence. So um, after sort of a cut, basically three years when we had thousands come in that way. We built a fence 
so and now we have a fence and the, i think the the first year that the fence was pretty much complete we had 78 people come through it the next year none or one um so it, it was it was as good as the americans hope their wall their trump wall will one day be and it's a fence not a wall but now we're in the position where we have something like 40,000 uh, migrants a lot of them living in southern uh, tel aviv the uh, crime's gone through the roof in these areas they, they don't it just it doesn't look good but we as a nation um when surveyed we want to get we, we're very happy that our government's taking action to deport asylum seekers in fact fully in the last um uh, public opinion survey 66 percent of those surveyed in israel agreed with the government's decision to deport uh, to safe African countries. Uh, and it's, it's only because of massive external left-wing and far-left pressure that this is even a story, really, for the outside world. So, you know, we've got the, a lot of Jewish organizations in America that lean left that are screaming at the government here, screaming at the Jews here, saying this is uh, horrible, this isn't Jewish values, they're refugees. Well, they're not. And I mean... One of the, the organizations I like has put out a, uh, a nice little box of facts that, um, that you know, I tweet out. But, you know, it comes with a lie. Israel is deporting asylum seeker. The fact is 70 percent of these asylum seekers have not requested asylum. They just never bothered to. Um, it's illegal to deport asylum seekers to third, third party countries. Well, actually, no, we you know, we, we've taken that through our Supreme Court, which leans left and has Arabs sitting on it. And no, even our Supreme Court agrees, as long as we're not sending them back to instant death, um, we can. Uh, we're also, we're paying. The, the, the plan that's come out is that if they leave uh, voluntarily, I think they're given three and a half thousand dollars, which is decent money. Uh, mm. Some people say that's too generous. We're only deporting the, the uh, we're only deporting adult men eight, over the age of 18 and single. If they've got families here, we're, we're not doing a deportation or, or, or getting rid of them. So, mm. and, and the other thing is that the number might seem small, 40,000 migrants, but we're, we're a country of 8 million of whom 2 million or so are Arabs. So 40,000 migrants is like 1.6 million people in the US. So it's a, it's a big deal for us. And mm. but still the point only 40,000. The, the, the interesting point here is yeah. um, offering incentives. One of the other things, I, I've got loads of flack for talking about offering in incentives. Mm -hmm. Obviously, offering incentives. I don't see why it's so insulting. If you want to make a more homogenous society, and obviously what you can't do is you can't force people to. You can, you can force illegals to go. You can probably... Um, forcibly deport criminals, repeated criminals yeah. who have been in the country for a, a shortish period of time, but offering incentives, um, then people take people take up incentives or not. And one of my arguments was that um, possibly in certain third world com countries, someone with three grand or whatever um, would really benefit. They'd have three thousand pounds. They might be able to bring their family members with them who would ha also have similar nest eggs to start something up, up with. Plus, they'd, they'd have had the benefit of having lived in a Western country and, and having had a Western education. So they'd, they'd be in a fantastic position to set up, set something up in Exactly. Be it Pakistan, be it somewhere in Africa. I mean, there are lots of places. There are lots of places where, with a bit of money, yeah. Um, you, we're, um, we're continually talking about how disastrous these places are, but that's not necessarily the case. Not all. No, no, no. There's plenty Africa of good shit on. Yeah. No, and and I, I mean, I know. I, you know, I deal with Cameroon. Um, uh, yeah. We've had. Uh, Someone I know has recently been in Ghana talking to them about doing trade with Ghana. You know, the point is that the point is to try and make Africa better, not make it make Europe the only place that they can go for a life. And, I, you know, but it's also, I but think, also, I mean, to be perfectly honest, Robin, uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, Brian, 
I don't know why I called you Robin. I've got no idea about that. Um, but to be perfectly <laughs> honest, Brian, my concern isn't this. This is where I get into trouble. I couldn't give a flying bollock about Africa. Um, yeah. I don't wish. I don't wish it any harm. I'm never going to go there. I don't care about Latin America either. I don't care about India. I'm never going to go there. Uh, I've never had the remotest interest. I like the music. I'll have a curry every now and again. But the places I want to visit, and I've, I've always been the same, I've, I've, I love visiting Europe. I love visiting places which I have an emotional and cultural connection with. So what I, I'm concerned about is making Europe as good as possible. Now, if you, if you end up with Europe, the people be in Europe, I don't want to be, it's not racism. Um, what I want to want to do is is have the people in Europe who of other ethnicities be here. If there's any inkling that you don't particularly want to be here, then bugger off and we'll help you. But it's surely it's going to decrease racism, then it's going to decrease tensions if the people that are in Britain, in France, or wherever, despite different colours in their in their skin. If they really want to be there and really buy into the values of the place, then no problem, mate. And that will make Europe much more uh, culturally homogeneous and culturally successful. That's my opinion. And I couldn't have. I couldn't give them. I don't care about Africa really. Do what you like. Well, Sorry. It, it, it's only a, a question of how much empathy one has, and um, and I mean the the only the only self interested reason to care is to prevent the migration, the mass migration, uh, or to at least, but but the other way to prevent the mass migration is just to bloody well not allow it. And that's build a wall, uh, you know, just mm. don't make your societies welcome uh, vast numbers of people who just arrive for an economic lift. That's it. And choose your immigrants. Every country should have the right to choose its immigrants. Israel's got a very firmly defined policy. Jews, yes. Everyone else, complicated and probably no. That's yeah. it. We, we, that's a decision we took. And, I, and there's no reason to stop Britain, France, America making those decisions on sane, rational lines. But Except one of the things the that, that, that the people, I think, decided, or the, it was, they were never asked. I mean, this is the point. The whole mass immigration of the 70s, 80s, nobody ever asked the people. Same in America with amnesty for vast numbers of illegals that turned California from a possibly Republican state to a definitely dem Democrat state. Nobody asked the people. That's what they've got. That's what they've, they've got no choices now. And, and the only, the last time they were given a choice between a, an anti uncontrolled immigration uh, platform or not was Trump and he won. And that's it. And the same. And, I, and, I, and we all know that the Brexit vote, immigration was a large contingent of, of, of why people voted Brexit. They just ignored all of the dire uh, financial warnings that, what, that it would happen, you know, what would happen to them personally. And they said, no, we just don't want this uncontrolled immigration that the EU forces upon us. Yeah. And one of the things that Gavin Bowby says, uh, he, he often says in quite an ominous way, slow the tide stop the tide turn the tide turn which i really back, yeah. which i really really like and I, I, I he knows if, if, he's, if you're watching this gavin you know i enjoy talking to you and i take on board a lot of the things you say because he's got a way of of encapsulating an idea um very very economically um but this is this is it obviously you've got to slow the tide so you've got to, you've got to start st stopping immigration you've got to stop the tide put a virtually complete ban on it, I would say, for the next few years. But then you've also got to turn the tide because, and there's no point in, in avoiding the realities of the situation because demogra there's a demographic reality here that the indigenous white British are being outbred. And one of the big dangers of the, issue, of, of the Islam issue is the Islam mm -hmm. issue seems to it, it camouflages other problems in society when you look at the problems of of crime in london for example that raheem kassan has been pointing out pete this is not a racist attitude someone who isn't criminal someone who who 
has fitted into British society and works, well, I've got no problem. And I, I would say the same about a poll or, or anybody else. So, so it's not specifically about um, black people or Muslims, but you have to face the fact that these are demographics that, that produce high, high levels of crime. And one of, when we obsess about Islam and one, when we obsess about Muslims, we tend to forget that the rise in knife crime, gun, gun crime, rapes, burglaries in London, it's not just Pakistanis, is it? Uh, no, no. It's not just black people either, but these are the two demographics that are particularly involved in this kind of thing. So at, at some point, we need to tackle this issue, and we need to tackle this issue as humanely and in as civilised way as possible. Uh, Got to say, you know, and we've seen similar things here uh, in Israel with the, you know, there is a crime wave in southern Tel Aviv, uh, and that's where most of the African migrants have landed. Now, it's not to say Jews are perfect, certainly not to say Arabs are perfect, but those are the you know that the culture and the society that we want here in israel is is what we've got we just we don't need to import more problems uh and and i you know but at least we take what i like about it is at least we're taking a positive decision and that's it we you know we're going to do it uh, if subject to our sort of internal left-wing minority and its control over the judiciary which we have which is a big problem you know we have a, but well, I mean, I think this is what Europe should be doing as well. And I suppose we've, we've got a few minutes left, but this could take us on to the very last issue. Um, yeah. I don't really, we've done enough with Darren Osborne on, on a, at other times, but Tommy's, Tommy Robinson continues oh, yeah. with his exploits in, in Europe. And he's been reporting on two things in, in Germany. Uh, I think they're a very positive sign for what's happening in Europe. There's lots of positive signs in Europe. Um, the political change in Austria, Austria um, I can't remember which country has decided to join Visegrad. I think I it think was Croatia. Croatia joined yeah, Hungary, so, Poland. and uh, Exactly. So, so that they're increasing the power block there. And the, the demonstrations against the rape gangs and the, the Muslim violence in Germany, Tommy Roberts was in Cottbus, um, my friend Ash Sharp, who writes for the, who's got his own website, The Republic Standard, and is a great write, writer, has written about the, the Cottbus um, demonstrations. And there seems to be increased demonstrations in Germany, which is a very, very positive sign. I think. Yeah, oh, well, and uh, those demonstrations, you know, which have been going on for years now, every week, Pegida puts people on the street, uh, and it's East Germany, a lot of it's East Germany. They know what communism is. They're not going back to that. And um, I, I, I mean, Tommy, Tommy uh, occupies quite a bit of my time. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll just, shall I just tell this? The last thing Go was, ahead. as he was coming back from Germany, he gets a call from, I, I believe he got a call from a, a Guardian reporter. And the Guardian reporter's trying, he's trying to make a story happen. This is what we work out afterward. So during the trial of Darren Osborne that we've, we've spoken of before, who was, who was convicted and sentenced to an absolutely massive sentence. Um, during that trial, Tommy put out two live stream videos of interviews with BBC journalist and a Sky News journalist. Yeah, I watched them. And they were fantastic because he really exposes the media's, what the media is trying to do, even if... I don't know if Sky, use, Sky News has used any of that footage. Maybe they did on the day, but it doesn't matter. And the BBC used tiny snippets of it. But just the questions, you can see from the questions, the whole thrust of what the BBC and Sky were doing was, Tommy is responsible for this man, Darren Osborne. That's it. That was the line of questioning. This man went, and because he was radicalised, but he was radicalised by the far right, and then we'll stop there. We won't say what was the far right talking about, and Tommy isn't far right, which was Islamic terror in Britain. So they're cutting the stages out to just focus on Tommy. So the Guardian calls up and tries to, they try to made us make a story. And the story they wanted to make was these two videos constitute contempt of court. They constitute talking improperly 
about a trial in progress. And for people outside of the UK who don't know this, the UK has got very strong restrictions on what you can say about a trial while it is running. Um, the idea is that so that it's kind of from another era because it's from the era of big print and big newspapers and big television. So the idea is that a big newspaper can't print something that if a juror sees it would be prejudicial to the way the juror looks mm. at the trial. But juries are all told, do not go and look up any details of how this court, this trial is being reported. You are to only watch what happens in the court. So what they tried to make out was that the, by streaming live these interviews that weren't set for broadcast until after the end of the trial, Tommy had committed a crime called contempt of court. Um, Tommy's already on a suspended sentence. That means that he's, he's in an 18 month period where almost any arrest for anything will put him in prison for three months. So the Guardian, they go and try and make this story because they go and ask, has any, what's buried in the, the article that the reporter writes the next day is this little line saying, nobody has complained about those two videos, not the police and not the public. So the two videos went out, they were seen by tens of thousands of people from on Facebook and on YouTubes and spread widely. Nobody picked up the phone and made a complaint. The police didn't do it and the public didn't do it. But in the Guardian article is this sentence that says anybody can make a complaint. So it's like the yeah. Guardian is fishing for people now to make a complaint. But the point is, is it the case is over. The guy was convicted. He's got a long sentence. If the court, if that court, if that judge now opens a contempt of court proceeding against Tommy, all it does is hand to the guy's defense. Uh, hey, look, there was something prejudicial about my trial. Let's have a retrial. I mean, there's in, lots of interesting things about that. You really should check out the, the Sky News uh, um, interview because it's the Sky News. Yeah. The, the interview comes to an end. I watched all these things prior to writing my own article on the, on the Darren Osborne case. But the, the, it comes to an end when when the the Sky um, journalist, for want of a better word, um, realises says, "Are you live streaming this?" And and Kev uh, Kev Carroll says, "Yeah, it's going out live, mate, now on on on, on Periscope." <laughs> and uh, and the, the the journalist puts on this stupid face and says, "Oh, you could be in contempt of court now." But as Tommy points out to him. He says, no, I haven't talked about Darren Osborne at all. I've talked about my reasons, the, the, how you're trying to involve me in the case. And if you um, work it out, Correct. at all times, I've said alleged killer. Yeah. So, so it's well, all and alleged. He's this turnaround actually only happens right at the moment when the journalists ask Tommen, so what are your thoughts on... I think he, I don't know if he said the conviction of Darren Osborne and, and, and that's when Tommy says, whoa, 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 he hasn't been convicted yet. And the journalist says, it's okay. This isn't going out until after. And then, and then yeah. Tommy looks at the live camera and you're on. And so that, at that point, you cannot say that anything was prejudicial and it would be the weakest, but let's not, let's not, let's not underline things. Just an arrest gets Tommy put in prison. So the left wants that. They know that. So it, it don't underestimate the danger of what they're trying to pull here, the stunt they're trying to pull. Uh, we've got a, a couple of minutes. We'll, we're rounding off now, I think. Um, also, another inter interesting news from Tommy is that he has stated, I've seen on in another live stream, that, and he said during this Sky interview that once he's got the, um, the, the transcriptions of what went on in court, um, he's going to go through the transcriptions and find out whether he can bring a case against the Crown Prosecution Service or the media for deliberately misreporting his involvement because they talk about, um, in the first days of the case, they talk about um, uh, Darren Osborne having received um, emails from Tommy, which he, he re received emails direct from Rebel Twitter Media. Direct Twitter messages was the report. Direct, direct Twitter, Twitter messages. messages. And yeah. we don't know whether it was the CPS or the press that said that. No, that, that was uh, Jada Franson. They talk about a direct Twitter message to Jada Franson, which was, thanks for following, one of these yeah, automatic exactly. messages. Automated. They're, they are so, they are such a lie, bunch of lying bastards, really. But the interesting thing is, if he manages to bring this case, then this, as you said before, 
this will invalidate a great deal of the case against Darren Osborne. And a final thing to point out was the 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 judge on the on the case was an Asian judge. Judge, I don't know whether she was Muslim, but she's the same judge that who gave who dropped the the sentence on a man who'd mown down a, a Muslim who'd mowed down people in Leicester, dropped his sentence from five to four years. And she's the same person that sentenced Darren Osborne to 43 years. We're, we're living in a politicized system. It's completely unacceptable. Yeah. And then we don't even get on to America and what's going on there with the police state. But <laughs> I think yeah. we should call it quits and just... Uh... I, I, I think we've had... We, we doubted whether we get through for, through an hour. I, have, we always I have no doubts about this at all. We always do. Um, no particularly interesting, you know, there's nice people on the on the chat. Great to see you there, folks. Um, we're going to bugger off now and we'll be back next week. Remember, I'll be here. I think Ash Sharp and Nick Ryder are definite for, Nick Ryder's from, for Britain, but he's not going to be talking for, for Britain, uh, are definite for Sunday. Uh, make sure you stream in at 7 o'clock GMT then. Me and Brian will be back next Wednesday at I don't know, we night. Might, we might have to do Thursday because I think I'm going to have to have part two of my multi-part horrible dental work. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss whether it might be I was, I was kind of hoping, hoping you would be unable to speak in this for this live stream, given your dental Pain work. Painkillers, mate. Painkillers. Okay, you got through it. Anyway, Brian... <laughs> uh, Look after you. Look after yourself, and we'll be back next week. I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. And thanks for everyone on the chat. Um, see you all, folks, and have a great time. All, all right. right, bye.